Today, we'll look at Cicero, which is an agent, an AI agent created by Meta AI that can play the game of diplomacy. Now, diplomacy is a special game because, because it is a board game where you need to communicate with the other players in order to coordinate actions and cooperate and also compete versus these other players. And this coordination, as I said, is in natural language in chat messages. So any AI agent has to actually communicate like a human to the other humans, at least if it doesn't want to get noticed as an AI agent. Uh, here you can see an instance of this board. And you can see there are these different territories. It's a bit pixelish, but I hope you can see they're like territories. And you can uh, see you can see the world subdivided into these factions, which each are represented in a particular color. So that would be all the things all the territories belonging to one given player, your goal is to get as many uh, as many territories as possible, uh, specifically the ones that have supply centers on them. And your moves are you have a bunch of moves available. So you can move troops around, but you can also attack other territories. Or you can, for example, support a player that attacks another territory. And that's where the chat comes in. So in a regular game down here somewhere, there'd be a chat window where you could chat with the other players, and you can coordinate what you want to do what this other player wants to do, you can form alliances and uh, form a uh, build up trust with the other players and so on. So this is very challenging for an AI agent in various ways. We've seen board games before like poker or chess, but they're always like just competitive between two players, uh, not really cooperative like this one. And obviously the chat messages here, um, they are a major part of this game. And you have to keep in mind that all the other players also communicate privately with each other, which is information that you don't know. So Meta has made this agent called Cicero that plays this game and places ranks about in the top 10% of all humans, uh, various in various tournaments. So this is pretty cool. Today, we're going to look at how they built this agent, how it works, and uh, you know what what it does and what it means. <laughs> so the paper is called human level play in the game of diplomacy by combining language models with strategic reasoning. As I said, it's by a set of authors at meta, and it's a pretty impressive system. Here in the abstract, it says, Cicero integrates a language model with planning and reinforcement learning algorithms by inferring players beliefs and intentions from its conversations and generating a dialogue in pursuit of its plans. Cicero achieved more than double the average score of the human players and ranked in the top 10% of participants who played in more than one game. Now, again, we're going to go through this paper. But let me say this ahead of time this works, this agent is good, because humans are dumb, like humans are really, really dumb. That's my conclusion from this. I've read the paper, I've uh, read the uh, supplementary material, I've watched a YouTube video, uh, which I'll link in the description by a professional diplomacy player who comments on a game that they played versus Cicero, like, uh, it's just one human against six of these agents. Uh, they've commented on that. And my conclusion is, that okay, I've I've it's overstated that humans are are stupid. But this game, in my opinion, is first and foremost interesting to humans because of the human element, because you can build up trust as a human, and which is a major function of this diplomacy feature of this chat feature. Uh, there's certainly want something to be said here about coordination, like the communication allows you to coordinate with other players, certain actions. But that's only part of why this is important. The other part is, as I said, building up trust, uh, chatter, uh, making people happy, and so on. And the, the, the fact that like, a professional, like a, the highest level of diplomacy players, still do that still like build up trust and still say, well, they say they, they say something like, well, um, here, if if I were to do this to a human, the human would be like, it would be really be really flipped off. And they would be against me for the rest of the game, even if it's irrational, but the bot doesn't do it because it's a bot. 
And to me, it's like, well, if the highest levels of players succumb to things like tilt and be, being like aggressive and, and, and damped because you stab them in the back ones, which is the most logical strategic move, then it's kind of like, I feel the humans play this because of that human element. Not necessarily, I feel, I feel in this game, um, you could get away with, with, you know, throwing away a lot of the dialogue except the coordination bit and you can still, you can just play optimally and there's nothing that people can do. I thought for a long time, you know, what game would I really want to see uh, AI play? And my first instinct was something like Werewolf or I guess the modern form is Among Us. Uh, because there are also like this negotiation and so on comes in. But again, it hit me there. Well, it's the human element. It's this human notion for trusting someone, which really has no place in a game like this. Like in a game theoretic setting, building up something like trust, it means very little if you don't play the game repeatedly over a long time. Like if it has an end, it doesn't like means nothing. The other player can just betray you at any point. And if they're better off, they, they want to do that. They would do it. Um, there, there's like, imagine in chess, if, if like, if you like start trusting your opponent or, or something like this, no, um, the highest levels, they are ruthless. And I think Among Us would just become super duper boring if you take the humans out of it. In any case, I feel it's still worth uh, developing this, this bot here to interact with the humans because capturing this human element is, I guess, part of what this research is about and not as much getting really good at diplomacy because it, it feels like the field of diplomacy isn't that advanced. I'm not sure if I'm insulting any diplomacy players right here, but from what I've seen, the whole chittery, chattery, trusty thing is, is like, it seems like the game is very far away from humans playing optimally. Okay, let's dive in. So in diplomacy, seven players conduct private natural language negotiations to coordinate their actions in order to both cooperate and compete with each other. So that's the core of the game. Cicero, this agent couples a controllable dialogue model with a strategic reasoning engine. So the strategic reasoning engine here will be responsible for deciding what moves Cicero makes and the controllable dialogue model will be con will be responsible for chatting with the other people. And here is an important thing to notice and a little bit while I think this research is really 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 cool and and um I'm a total fan of it but a criticism of me is that these things are quite disjoint. Um, and essentially, essentially, Cicero relies on this thing here very heavily on this strategic reasoning engine. So it plans its moves ahead, which is kind of sort of controlled by the dialogue it gets, but mm, only a little bit. It plans its moves ahead. Um, and then it just communicates what it wants to do to the other players using this right here. And because part of the game is about coordination and communication, and also because humans generally are seem to be honest, uh, and therefore the, this, the, the agent being always honest is also a good strategy or happens to be a good strategy. In any case, what the, the model doesn't consider is strategically using language, right? It just uses language, it determines what it wants to do. And then it uses language to like communicate that out. Um, but and then it, it there's some filtering and so on. But it never considers the what it says, as a part of the strategy, like it never thinks, Oh, if I say this to that person, then, uh, you know, next turn, they're going to do that, at least not to the degree uh, with which I would have hoped. And we're going to see that, but, but keep keep that in mind. Also, the dialogue module as such is more like a translator. So they try to essentially parse out what they call intents of the game. And then they simply use the dialogue model to translate those intents like, you know, troop one moves to that country to translate that into like, hey, my troops are going to move to that country. Is that okay with you? Um, but it's, it's not really part of the strategy, uh, the language. 
So that those are a bit of the the disappointments that I have right sorry right here, uh, but I think they also serve as the basis for further research. So first of all, they go into a little bit um, into a little bit of so background. What are the what are the challenges of human AI cooperation in diplomacy? Uh, they say in games involving cooperation, self play without human data is no longer guaranteed to find a policy that performs well with humans. This is in contrast to things like chess or go where you can just have two agents, right, have uh, agent one, and agent two, and they just play against each other all the time. And they will get better and better and better and hopefully converge to a really strong solution and under some conditions and optimal solutions. Now, this is no longer guaranteed if you need to cooperate, especially what they say right here, a strategy that performs well with humans, right? And that's the crux right here. Uh, it's not necessarily about finding the most optimal strategy, uh, even as I understand it, the most optimal strategy against humans, it's a strategy that performs well with humans if you need to cooperate. Although in this game, I think you could find like a really good strategy, absent of, of much communication. Yeah, it says it may converge to a policy that's incompatible with human norms and expectations. And that's the human element that I mentioned, these norms and expectations. I think that's what makes these games interesting makes these games fun to humans to sort of like, um, you know, is it is are they telling the truth? Are they lying? Oh, they betray me? How could they betray me? Things like this. It's that that's what makes it fun, right? And I think that's why people play play these games. And you know, interest like that, that's, as I said, that's the exact aspect that's kind of not modeled in the dialogue model right here and in the strategic aspect. So that's where a little bit of my my um, criticism would come from right here. But you know, future research. Um, so here is a bunch of stats, the average, the agent here sends and receives an average of 292 messages per game. So this is a very chatty game, the chat is really a big part of the game. It's not as much the moves, it's like chat, 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 coordinate, negotiate, um, small talk, I guess, maybe. <laughs> so the challenges they say each message the agent sends must be grounded. If they just had like some sort of language model, uh, it would do whatever, even if it's trained on data of that game. However, you have to have a way to control the language model to say language model, please transmit this piece of information right here to the other player. And we're going to see how they train a language model that does it. They say, lastly, diplomacy is a particularly challenging domain because success requires building trust with others in an environment that encourages players not to trust anyone. Each turns actions occur simultaneously after non binding private negotiations. Again, it encourages players to not trust anyone yet you need to build trust. Uh, that's the crux, I guess. So I've already explained the a game in itself. Yeah, one thing that I found important was this ability that a unit may support other units, including those of another player. And I think that is one of the mechanics that makes this game, you know, include this aspect of cooperation and coordination between players. So it might very well be that players who do coordinate, even if they're technically enemies who do coordinate for a move or two, uh, are better off uh, at the end than had they not coordinated. So there is a general overview over this agent, we're going to look at some parts in more detail, but this is essentially it, you have this board state and the um, history over here. This is quite your standard input to a reinforcement learning pipeline. So the board state is essentially what's happening right now. And the history is what was the move before and before and before that. And sometimes that's actually relevant for the game, like in chess, uh, the history plays a plays, it has an influence to some degree, like you can't make certain moves twice. Um, in Atari games, it has some degree of relevance, because if something flies with some velocity, you want the history 
uh, to estimate which direction it flies in. Sometimes it's just kind of helps the, um, even if, if this is Markovian, sometimes it seems to help the algorithms uh, just because humans be humans, I guess. And it's not Markovian after all, but you can think of that yourself. In any case, we get the board state as an input and that goes into different directions, as you can see. So the first is this planning module here. The planning module is very classic reinforcement learning planning module. So we get, we go from essentially from the state, um, we determine a policy for all the players. So that is, that is what a um, such a planning module does. You can think of it a little bit like the Monte Carlo tree search in alpha zero or something like this, except now you don't have two players, you have many players. So what you want to do is you want to determine a joint action, which means all the players move at the same time in this game. So, you, so one action is going to be what every player is doing. And the policy, what the policies are essentially the action uh, distribution of all the players. Then you want to forward simulate that uh, into a future state and essentially repeat that. So you plan multiple steps into the future. And um, what you can also do is you can sort of run an improvement algorithm to make your policy better against all the other policies and then these policies better and so on. So this is very classic, I would say, um, not even reinforcement learning. This is just a very classic sort of policy computing uh, algorithm that you might know from from uh, game theory papers or something like this. The only interesting thing here or the novel thing is that you do get an input from um, what's called here the, these anchor policies. The anchor policies are what keeps the strategy in at a human level. And it's a bit tricky uh, to explain just here. But essentially, if you let the model just do reinforcement learning, just do sort of computational planning up here, you quickly get into a state that's what they explained above, where the actions become like non human. So where the actions, the the algorithm thinks they're optimal, but the human would say like, that's kind of weird. No human plays like this. And I've definitely seen sometimes this video commentator uh, say something like this, like, ah, that move is very bot like. Now, usually, usually in something like chess or so, um, if you know, alpha zero is like 10 times as strong as the strongest human, and the bot does something weird, then you're like, I guess that's a really good move, we should learn what that move is about. Now here, it's a, li a bit more tricky because the it's it's a lot about you know this this trust element this human element there is a value to being more human um even if that means that technically you deviate from the most optimal optimal action at least that's how the authors see it and that's why they have these anchor policies so the anchor policies are behavior cloning uh, policies. So what you do is you take a big data set, I guess here a big data set from from human place, and you train a behavior cloning algorithm. Behavior cloning essentially means I take one game out, here is a state and an action and a state and an action, I just observe past games, how they went. And I just train a model that if it's given a certain state is trained to perform the same actions as the humans did in that game. Um, yeah, this is sometimes phrased as imitation learning, sometimes phrased as behavior cloning has different names, but all about the same ideas. And that policy that they call an anchor policy, because it anchors the model to what a human would do. Uh, it's not necessarily the best action, but it's an action that a human would do. It's a little bit like a discriminator in a, a, an adversarial model. Um, so they mix these two things, they always mix the anchor policy with the reinforcement learned or with the computed policy in order to get a model that performs both well, and like humans. Um, yeah, and you can see right here, the anchor policies, those are dialogue conditional. So you can see that here, uh, dialogue conditional, because in this database, 
you obviously not only have the state as the board was, but you also have all the chit chat that goes on inside of the state, right? So you condition this behavior cloning policy, you say, okay, here is how the board looks here, are what the humans have communicated, what has the human done, and you try to clone that those are your anchor policies. Interestingly enough, up here, um, you see in this cycle here, there is no notion of any of the dialogue. So all this planning here happens without the dialogue, whereas I think at least we might, yes, all this planning here happens without the dialogue, uh, except the dialogue comes in via the dialogue conditional action model. Um, so from here, the dialogue comes into this model, and then that information goes up here. But that's very, very indirect. It's essentially the only information that the planning has about the action is what would a human do in this situation, um, given this board and this dialogue, right? This, this board and this dialogue. That's the only information that you have about the dialogue. You don't have the input dialogue directly. And your actions, your, the actions that you do, are not uh, including what dialogue you're going to send. Here you see only at the output of this planning module, you have something that you call intents. So an intent is essentially a plan to move somewhere. So the output of the planning module is here, the output action, what you do, but before you do it, it or at, at the same time, before the turn is over, you can also communicate to the others. So you compute what you want to do, um, based on everything that's happening. And then you determine these intents. So you say, I think, um, I'm gonna move my I'm gonna move my troop from here to here, and they are gonna move their troop from here to here. And you can encode that as these intents. And as I said before, what the language model does is it um, it takes these intents and it translates them into chat messages. So based on these intents, you now go and you communicate with the other humans. So you can see right here, the message model or the message generation module here gets three inputs, the board state as well. So it knows what the board looks like, then the current dialogue, like what currently has been discussed. So now it's the turn of the agent to say something. And from up here, it gets these intents. So it knows how does how do things look like? Um, what has the other person told me, I guess, like, what's the current status of the chat? And what do I want to do next turn? And what do I expect the other people to do next turn? And from that, the dialogue model then generates message candidates, which go through filters. And if they pass the filter, they go into the chat. So the bot answers. So here you can see that the bot says something like, Hi, Italy, care to work together on this one. If you, if you support me there, I think we would both be able to grow quickly. Italy, which is the human in this turn says, could you support me into Bull into Bulgaria in return. So now Austria takes everything into account what it wants to do what it thinks Italy wants to do based on what's been said and so on. And then it says, Sure thing. I have ordered Sir to support Greece or Serbia to support Greece to Bulgaria. And yeah, so that's how the whole thing works. We take in the current state. Um, we take in the current dialogue. From that we compute um, two different things. First of all, we compute these anchor policies right here, like what would humans be doing, then we with the help of that, we also determine a best action to take, which is this planning loop right here. Once we have the best action, we uh, generate these intents from that, that's just mechanical, what do I want to do? What do the other people want to do? Those are just the policies essentially written out as intents. And from that, we generate our messaging, our messages, um, which are intent conditioned.
And this happens in multiple steps, as I said, multiple planning loops. So what I said before, like the, the dialogue doesn't come into the planning. It does, but as I said, not in like a super direct way. The, the agent cannot decide to strategically tell some other player something. Like the agent can only decide on an action and then the dialogue model is just responsible for communicating that action to the other players. Right. The dialogue model is a central thing here. It was trained to be controllable via intents. So what you want to do is you want to have a dialogue model. I have it somewhere right here. Here. The dialogue, um, here. a message is defined to have intent Z, if Z is the most likely set of actions that the sender and recipient will take for both the current turn and several future turns. So that's how they determine the intent uh, during training. So during training, they take a data set, they obviously don't know the plans of the people, but they take a data set and they annotate each chat message with what they think is the intent. And um, that's this is how how they annotate it. So they define the intent as essentially like the plan that results out of this chat message. They say we developed techniques to automatically annotate every message in the training set with a set of actions corresponding to the message content. During training, the dialogue model learned the distribution, uh, this distribution where Z represents the intent for data point X and Y. So X here is the input, whatever the dialogue model gets as an input, Z is the intent, like what the agent thinks the plan of everyone is, or what they heuristically determined. And then Y is the the output. Here you can see some of these um, some examples. So in this case, um, the, the dialogue model is tested for different intents. So on the top, you see a situation and um, a, a number of actions. So it's always the same starting state. You can hopefully see that uh, if you compare the pictures a little bit, but the actions are different. So the agent here is, uh, is England. And you can see, for example, this troop here is, I guess, going here, that's the action that England takes or wants to take. Um, over here, it goes over here and over here, it also goes over here, but it even does does a bunch of other things in turn. And every time you can see that the chat messages that the bot sends now change. So um, I'm not a diplomacy player. So all I know is what they tell me. So here they says, they say, uh, England convoys an army to Belgium with the support of France and Germany while taking Norway in a manner friendly to Russia. So we expect these actions to be reflected in the chat messages. So to France, it says, would you mind supporting this um, EDI to Belgium? So it sends, since that is its intent to move into Belgium, it asks France, hey, would you like to support me? If since wait, Oh, the Germans, it also wants the German support. So they say, do you want to support my convoy to Belgium? With Italy going aggressive, France will fail quickly, and we can make gains of both Russia and France. So here you can see a bit of an extended example of uh, this dialogue model. Now, to me, it's like a, a tiny bit unclear where this comes from, because they said that intents cover both this turn and turns in the future. So it's quite likely that some of what the dialogue model here says is also contained in the intent and it's kind of like the dialogue model presents it. It's also somewhat likely that the dialogue model just sort of makes makes stuff up because it sees the board, right? The dialogue model, um, right? Yes, the dialogue model as far as I, yeah, the dialogue model sees the board itself and it sees the current intent. So it's also quite likely the dialogue model has learned to just look at the board and kind of talk to people about the board state as such. And I think that's pretty cool. Like, um, so it's not only it's not only kind of 
mindless translating of these simple intents. It's not just like, I want your support there. Please attack there. Please don't do this. It The conversation it has are surprisingly rich, surprisingly uh, sort of flowery. And I'm actually surprised that this is learned from human data because as far as I know online games, it, like this must be like the friendliest online game I've ever seen. People are absolutely uh, nice and, and polite to each other. So uh, it says to Russia, how are you thinking Germany is going to open? I may have a shot at Belgium, but I need your help to get into Denmark next year. So again, the intent next year, next turn, or next, uh, there's always like three seasons to a turn uh, to a year. Um, so it asks Russia for help in the future at some point. So that's pretty cool. And if you change the actions that you want to do, then the chat messages change. So a clear example of how the chat messages uh, are dependent on what you want to do are controllable. And they also measure this and they find that the quality of the chat messages improves as well as rated by experts. And the sort of test perplexity on a test data set improves once they classify the intents behind the actions and not just let like a language model run rampant. So here is how they train the dialogue model, the intent um, control dialogue model. Step one is they train this intent model. So this is the model that takes a chat message that it sees and spits out the intents. So it spits out what it thinks the chat message wants to convey in terms of like the basic moves of the game. Um, this is only than used to annotate a bigger data set. We've seen this number of times. And this seems to be a really cool and nice strategy that you train an intermediate model that then helps you to annotate a bigger data set. And if you can get some very high quality data for that intermediate model, then you can essentially create your own training data on a much larger scale, especially in these uh, RL papers, this seems to be quite a common, um, a common thing. And yeah, it seems worthy of imitation if you're ever in a situation like this. So here we have a dialogue history from a data set on the left hand side. And um, you can see these chat messages right here. And the intent model, it, uh, I think it looks at the board state, yeah, and the history of the chat. Um, and it is tasked with uh, parsing out the intent. And it is trained on a a set of what they call truthful situations. So they go through the data set and they heuristically determine when are people telling essentially the truth about what they want to do. And that's how they train um, their intent model, they train to predict those things. So the intent model essentially takes chat message and, and outputs well, here is what this chat message means in terms of actions. Then they go through the data set and they use the intent model here uh, to annotate the whole data set. As I said, they go through the chats and they say, well, England, this was the chat message. They meant to convey this basic action. And through these intents, um, the agent understands the game. So these language parts here, they almost like, act like a translation pipeline between the human world, the natural language world, and something the agent can understand, namely this intent world. Uh, then they train this dialogue model. So the dialogue model gets both the board state and history and the dialogue history. And the dialogue model, as I said, understands that this in terms of these intents. And once the dialogue model is trained, you can then run inference. Um, so you use all of this to do planning. From the planning, you get the intents and the intents go into the dialogue model. So during training, you get the intents from your annotated data set. And during inference, you get the intents from the actual planning algorithm, like the planning algorithm tells you, okay, forget the chat history, I have determined 
also based on the chat history, of course, but I have determined that here are the the intents, the actions that people are probably going to do. And then it gives that to the dialogue model to handle. These are obviously a much better um, prediction of what's actually, uh, what people are actually planning to do than just the chat history. They said, we considered other notions of intent during development, such as controlling messages to focus on specific subsets of actions, third party actions, or to have a particular tone. But I don't think they've included them because it's very, very hard. Uh, so these intents, they essentially cover sort of the direct what the player and its its counterparties want uh, to do out of the game. And not like, oh, say this in an angry tone, say this in a hopeful tone or something like this. That's for future work. So going through this, I think we um, we covered a lot of this thing already. Um, yeah, exactly. So Cicero conditions its dialogue on the action that it intends to play for the current turn. Uh, this choice maximizes Cicero's honesty and its ability to coordinate. And they say it sometimes led to out of distribution intents when the intent a intended action was hostile. So since Cicero is always like honest because it's trained on this kind of truthful subset and it just it just communicates its intents out. So sometimes it just tells humans like, I'm going to attack you where a real human would like either lie or just say nothing at all because hostile being hostile. But the bot has no, the bot has no like, notion of oh this is not socially appropriate so it just knows i need to communicate my intents which i i find quite funny i think um so here is an evaluation if you uh just use a language model um and you look at dialogue quality and perplexity in the data set you improve quite a lot if you also ground it in the game state and uh, you improve then again, if you ground it in these predicted or annotated uh, intents. And that's what this model does right here. So now we go through the strategic reasoning part. As I said, this is more like the classic, uh, classic planning algorithm rather than something very novel and also doesn't rely on the natural language as much as you would, I guess I would have hoped. So it says Cicero runs a strategic reasoning module that predicts other players' policies and also its own, I guess, for the current turn based on the state of the board and the shared dialogue, and then chooses a policy for itself for the current turn that responds optimally to the other player's predicted policy. So the input to this, as I said, is the state of the board and the shared dialogue. But the output action is just like a policy and the policy is just a distribution of actions. What I would want to see is that the policy also includes language actions. So here actions in the in the policy, it's purely like, oopsie, sorry. It's purely, uh, you know, what you saw before, like, I want to go from Belgium to whatever other place. But I would really love to see that the action set here gets extended by something like uh, tell Russia to go to somewhere, right? That right now, this is just a consequence of the action I select. And the language model is just tasked with communicating this. But if this here was an action too, then my planning module could actually reason about what it would be best to communicate and to whom uh, in order to achieve my goals. And I think that would make it much more interesting, obviously also much harder, but also much more interesting. Um, yeah, so they, here they go into uh, saying uh, it requires predicting how humans will play. Uh, behavior cloning is a choice. However, pure behavioral cloning is brittle, especially since the supervised model may learn spurious correlations. So they have a variant of PIKL. Uh, it's an iterative algorithm that predicts policies by assuming each player seeks to maximize the expected value of their policy and minimize 
the KL divergence between that policy and the behavior cloning policy, which we call the anchor policy. So again, they want to maximize their reward uh, by simply being a cold hearted bot. And they also want to stay close to what a human would do in order to fit in with the humans who actually play a cooperative game with the humans. They go a little bit into that here, you can see that clearly here is the essentially utility of a policy. And here is the KL divergence between your policy and the anchor policy. And there is a trade off parameter called lambda that controls how much of which there is. Interestingly, interestingly, at some and I think that's later and I have it marked somewhere, but I'm going to say it now, otherwise I'll forget it. Once they do the actual inference, they tone down this lambda um, quite a bit. Um, so they use this in, in two different uh, settings, once to like annotate and infer things. And then once they select their own action, they tone down this lambda quite a bit. So essentially, they're saying like, yeah, we want to be like the humans, but then, you know, we really want to win. And I think that's what what results in some of these like bot like moves that the commentator uh, commented. And it tells me already again, a little bit that the humans who are playing this game probably aren't playing it very optimally. Otherwise, uh, it would not be that much necessary to, um, to have this lambda up. It, once you to have this lambda very high when you infer the human actions, but have it much lower, sorry, this hand, to have it much lower when uh, the when when you determine your own action because you want to win the game. Essentially means that the humans could also play a bit more optimal and win the game a bit more often. Um yeah. So we went we went from we went from how can we control the dialogue via the actions we plan. And now we see the other way around. Dialogue conditional planning. Oops, that's out of your reach. How does the dialogue that happened affect the planning I do? I, before I said it doesn't much, but uh, it does in, in this indirect way. Uh, but nevertheless, the dialogue very much affects uh, what the bot wants to do or does. So here, um, the bot is France, a blue player. And the opponent here is England, the chat partner that it chats currently with is England. And here you can see if one message if England says, Yes, I will move out of England if you head back to NAO. Then uh, the text here says Cicero predicts England will retreat from ENG to NTH 85% of the time, backs off its own fleet to NAO as agreed and begins to move armies away from the coast. However, if England says something like, you've been fighting me all game, sorry, I can't trust that you won't stab me, um, then the actions change. Cicero does not back off its fleet, but rather attacks EDI with it and leaves its armies at the coast to defend against an attack from England, predicting that England will attack about 90% of the time. And that's just based on the dialogue, right? So you can I, I almost apologize a little bit because I think I feel at the beginning, I have um, sort of understated the importance, but you can see how this comes in here. So you have two policies uh, that you determine one is just planning the other one is this behavior cloning policy, which is dialogue conditioned. So in this case, the system looks at this chat message versus this chat messages. And it determines in this behavior cloning policy, what would a human do that has sent me this chat message, and that that goes into this strategic planning module. On the other hand, it it determines what, what would a human do that has said this thing right here. And that goes into the strategic uh, planning module. So the bot adjusts its own action by understanding how humans would behave when they have uh, sent a certain chat message. Again, this is the this is as far as I understand it, the result of the behavior cloning training and not 
the strategic planning itself. So the strategic planning isn't going to be like, well, they said this, but are they saying it because they want to convince me of something and therefore I should do this and that, right? It's not that. It's just like, oh, a human that says this probably uh, attacks me 90, like a bunch of times, right? So I'm going to adjust my the policy uh, because of this part, because of this part right here. Um, because this part here is still kind of the same. All right. So that's what they say right here. Cicero does not explicitly predict whether a message is deceptive or not, but rather replies on PIKL to directly predict the policies of other players. And yeah, that being said, the policy of other players isn't just a result from the behavior cloning. Um, the policy of the other players is also determined via the strategic planning model. It's just that the information um, about the dialogue that goes into the strategic planning comes from comes through the behavior cloning uh, part. So they go into a little bit of modeling here. You get obviously a lot of uh, cases where you need to I want to I almost say improvise a little bit. For example, you don't have the private conversations between the other players, yet still you have to model it somehow, right? Um, so uh, it's it, it at various points, they use various methods to sort of infer the strategies of the different players, they do that iteratively. They say during strategic planning for each player, Cicero computes an anchor policy for both itself and the player based on their shared conversation, the board state and the recent action history. Cicero then ran DILPIKL, which is uh, their variant of PIKL that not only includes two players, but I think, uh, is that the variant? I think so. I think I'm describing the right thing here. Oh no, DILPIKL for the two players is that distributional? Okay. For the two players, in order to predict player J's policy, on each iteration, Cicero assumed the five remaining player would play according to a policy computed via RL. So since you don't have the dialogue, you don't have the behavior cloning policy because that relies on the dialogue. Therefore, you need to compute some policy via reinforcement learning uh, to just approximate a policy. Conditional on the policy of Cicero and player J. This process gave an independent prediction of each player's policy. Uh, next, Cicero accounted for the fact that the player's policies were not independent due to their ability to correlate their actions with private dialogue. So they adjust it um, by the likelihood ratio of A under the correlated and independent RL policies. So there's a lot of adjustment happening for the fact they don't have all the information. You'll find this commonly in RL algorithms that where there's some hidden information and even in some where there isn't hidden information, um, but that don't sample uh, uniformly. It's a bit of a same concept. And Finally, Cicero chose or chooses the action that best corresponds to the predicted joint policy of all the other players. The minus i here means the ith player uh, isn't meant, while still being as consistent as possible with its dialogue. And here is what I said. Um, Cicero uses a smaller lambda for regularizing its best response than for its computation of the other player's policies. So it's kind of like, <laughs> yeah, I want to be like a human, but I really, I really want to win. <laughs> so this, uh, they say this allows Cicero more leeway to deviate when the action it predicted humans would most likely choose in its situation was suboptimal, which I guess tends to be quite, or at least sometimes. Um, yeah, so then they go into how they use self play reinforcement learning in that. So they run this in an iterative fashion, they not only do it once, so they run it in an iterative fashion, they compute optimal policies, they go around, do it again, again, and so on. Um, I don't want to go too much into that. Uh, if you want to read it, it's a it's a short paragraph. And as a bit of a supplementary. So the, the supplementary material is quite huge. Uh, so props for releasing a lot of that. Lastly, 
they have this paragraph on message filtering, which is a last step where they boost the, the performance and the um, way, the quality rated by experts of these models, again, by quite a lot. They say neural language models suffer from contradictions, inconsistencies, as well as a tendency to hallucinate or to generate factually incorrect information. Uh, they say their model obviously does the same, uh, it deviates from the intents and use uh, that used to control the message. It blunders in the strategic content of the message. We approach this problem by filtering generated message using a series of classifiers and checks to detect common issues. This is essentially post-processing of their message model. So they sample, and if it doesn't pass the filters, I guess they just sample again. By the way, are these are these here intended? These references, I'm not exactly sure. In any case, they say discriminating between human text and counterfactuals. So here you go into the question, what, how can we filter out kind of garbage, if the data set that we have is all generated by humans, and therefore we have to assume that it's at least somewhat sensible. Um, so you just create your own garbage. They say, we generated many kinds of counterfactual messages that contain mistakes language models are prone to, including heuristically corrupted text, as well as model generated negatives. We trained a suite of 16 classifiers to discriminate between the ground truth human message and different kinds of counterfactual messages. So essentially just train classifiers uh, that can differentiate their created garbage from regular human messages. And they hope that they have gotten close enough to the common mistakes that language models make. And also that they've captured enough of those mistakes in their heuristics, such that the classifiers will get um, will generalize, essentially, and just generally filter out most non human text. The this is um, also interesting, they said we filtered messages that would reduce the likelihood of the actions in the intent. Um, yeah, so they can determine from the message they would send, like, uh, what how, can we classify the intent because they have the model that takes a chat message. Um, and then classifies the intent, or even they can take that chat message and feed it back into their planning algorithm and essentially say, well, does that does that does that make it more or less likely that I'm going to do the actions that I want to communicate? If it makes it less likely, they determine probably it's not saying what I wanted to say, and they throw it away. Again, their their goal or their their design here is such that the language model is like extremely honest about what it wants to do. And they counter it with this next thing. This is the only place where they sort of like, where they counter this tendency to be like this super duper honest. And they say, conditioning on intents can lead to information leakage where an agent reveals compromising information about its plan to an adversary. Uh, to mitigate this, we developed a method to score potential messages based on their estimated value impact. We computed the PIKL policies for all agents after each candidate message and filtered those that led to lower expected value for Cicero playing its intended action. So I didn't discuss this explicitly, but they have a value function um, and the value computation method. So they run this planning algorithm forward, they can see into the future, and they can determine the value of the game for the player, much like alpha zero or uh, alpha go or something like this. And now they take the chat message that they want to send, and they determine is this even good for me down the road, if I send this message, and if it turns out it's probably not that good for me, if I send this message, then they don't send it. So that's a little bit of a counter to just being fully open and just communicating uh, whatever you're gonna do to everyone, which is not always the best thing in this game. So they have a bunch of other filters, they say here, uh, if you want to check them out, they're in the supplementary material. And the last thing they say is how they participated in human play. So they played a bunch of online tournaments without telling the humans that it's a bot. And I found this I found this quite interesting. Uh, the website notifies users that the website has participated in AI research, and that certain game modes allow users to play with AI agents. 
Um, but in these games, the humans were not explicitly informed that they were playing with an AI agent for that particular game. Cicero's participation as an AI was revealed to all players after the conclusion of the research. I've seen actually a message by one of these players and that person was completely flabbergasted. They were like, I got the email and I'm like, what? That was an AI? No way. I like, <laughs> so uh, the, the model is quite um, good. But I, I can't help but notice that, that this is an experiment on, on human subjects and really, really needed to go to an ethics review board. And I was under the impression that it's extremely terrible to let people uh, interact with a bot and not tell them with every message explicitly that it is a bot. And uh, um, I don't want to draw false equivalences here. This is very cool research and in, in no way do I think anyone was in danger uh, by not knowing that this was a bot. So uh, that was the, the paper. They have a bit of a discussion down here and a bit of more examples. So here they have a bunch of successful dialogue examples on the left where they coordinate. So Cicero is Austria. Italy, Italy says something like, what are you thinking long term? Should I go for Turkey or head west? And you can see just, I mean, if you read this dialogue, oh, sorry. If you read this dialogue, you can see how like it's, it's not just like blah, I communicate the intent very plainly, but it really reacts to the other players. It really talks about them, about also longer term strategy. It refers to states, things that are on the board uh, correctly. It refers to its plans a few turns in ahead correctly and so on. So here Italy uh, or Austria says something, it convinces Italy to go to, I don't know, Turkey or, or beat Turkey. Uh, Italy says, I'm down to go for it. Would you would definitely need your help in supporting me? And Austria says, of course, happy to do that. Fantastic. On the other hand, here's an example of negotiation. Uh, France is Cicero. France says, I'll work with you, but I need Tunis for now. Turkey says, nope, you got to let me have it. And France says, no, I need it. You have Serbia and Rome to take. Uh, they're impossible targets. And then France suggests a series of moves and Turkey says, hmm, you're right. Good ideas. <laughs> so I'm um, again, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure that the humans here, um, maybe th that particular human, I'm not, I'm not sure. I, I've never played this game, so I can't tell if this is actually something that, that happens at a high level of play still that someone suggests a series of moves to you and you're like oh yeah that that is a good idea i'm pretty sure like really good players consider uh, all of the things already but um yeah in any case i i think i still think it's like really really cool research um here they say, although Cicero is shown to be effective at cooperating with humans, it occasionally sends messages that contained grounding errors, contradicted its plans, or were otherwise strategically subpar. Uh, but they say, well, essentially, humans occasionally make similar mistakes, which is probably an understatement. Like humans are chaotic and, and dumb. And Cicero is probably like the most honest, the most like consistent player in the entire world at this game. From a strategic perspective, Cicero reasoned about dialogue purely in terms of players' actions for the current turn. It did not model how its dialogue might affect the relationship with other players over the long-term course of a game, considering this might allow it to deploy dialogue more strategically. The expressive power of our intent representation limited Cicero's ability to control richer affordances of dialogue, such as strategically revealing information, asking questions, or providing explanations for its actions. And that is exactly the, the kind of thing I said at the start. It's a really cool research to show that you can actually pair language models with these things and, and interact with humans in this way. However, the language models here, they more, in, they more act as like a, a translation engine between just what the planning spits out um, or what the planning needs as an input uh, rather than as sort of 
uh, actions to be taken by itself. And I would really see the continuation of this work where the model also considers kind of like its own dialogue as actions. That's not going to be, it's not going to be super uh, easy, I want to guess, to, to do that. Um, especially also because, yeah, as my suspicion is still that humans here are far from the optimal strategy and therefore the whole balance between behavior cloning and training on this human data set and actually making moves might be quite far apart and I'm not sure how to reconcile that best. Uh, it might also be that the humans through this bot come to learn that actually there's probably better strategies around, which has happened in like Go and chess and poker so far. Um, so I'm excited to see what the future brings. Definitely recommend to check out the YouTube video by the commentator. It has a lot of gems in there and a lot of things where you can kind of uh, see the effects that the bot training has had. It, it, they also say, well, uh, yeah, the bot is quite honest uh, for one. And also the bot is quite like non-emotional. So even if you stab it in the back, it would be like not mad at you. It would still be completely rational and things like this. And to me, that's it's, it's, um, it's very cool to see that even in such a game, the human element seems to be sort of the primary uh, fun maker, even at a high level of play. And yeah, I, I think that's, that's, I think the, the best message we get out of this research. All right, I uh, hope you enjoyed this paper review. Uh, wish you a very pleasant evening, and I'll see you around. Bye bye.